<laughs> Thanks. I want to welcome everybody to our program meeting tonight. And I want to also extend a warm wel welcome to Nick Stover, and you'll hear from him later. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't believe we have any guests here at Lone Tree tonight. All these faces look familiar, right? So I wanted to check and see if we have any guests on Zoom. And welcome to all of you as well. Okay, Steve, would you like to say a few words? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. You're muted. He's muted. It's Hi, how are you? Fine, uh, how are Butch, you? Uh, Butch Mazuka asked me to uh, oh. check this club out. And uh, so I'm here. Great. Well, welcome. Glad to have you tonight. Okay, so I just I have one announcement and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dave to get the program started. And I just want to remind everybody that we will be having a meet the mentoring meeting at our home on the 25th of this month, September. And it'll be an opportunity for you to actually meet and talk with some of the mentors here at Focus and uh, share some of the areas that you might like to be, you know, receive some help in. So we look forward to seeing some more of you. And uh, with that, I'll just turn it over to Dave. Victoria, thank you very much. I, I hope that a lot of people can, can uh, participate in that mentor program. Uh, yeah, that's, we do. A real, that's a real strength of our of our um, of our club. So, Steve, I'm going to back up a little bit, not to to steal any thunder from Victoria, but I know that Butch invited you. But I'm I'm just kind of curious to find out a little bit more about you. And then I know we have another guest as well. But I mean, you know, so Butch kind of, you know. Kind of made the con or made the context uh, for you for focus, but tell us a little bit. What are you looking to to get out of a camera club, or or what would you be interested in? Oh, I'm just interested in. Um, uh, I'm always interested in sharing photographs and techniques, and um, you know, uh, getting involved in the critique process, especially when it's as uh, low key and friendly as Butch was explaining that this club is. Um, I've uh, experimented with a few others where it's very, very pass, pass or fail and, uh, you know, some fairly harsh talk really about photographs rather than, uh, you know, going at it from a learnings perspective and a growth perspective. So it just sounded like my kind of place. I've known Butch for quite a long time. He's one of my clients from my Lightroom and Photoshop support uh, business. And so, uh, I'm just in, interested in uh, finding a group like this. It's nice that it's on Zoom for me. I'm up in outside of Fort Collins. It'll be kind of a long drive okay. coming okay. in person. Well, you'll find that we're kind of a kinder, gentler photo club. Um, it, it's all about, you know, kind of bringing people along and improving, you know, because this is a, <laughs> kind of a shared shared love for all of us. So Right, right. So, I mean, I, I think that sometimes, um, you know, some ju judges can be a little harsh it's kind of tough to, to put out your print and have somebody stab you through the heart with it you know whatever but i think you'll you'll find us good you know our and this goes for the other guests we have as well kim but i mean we have two meetings a month we have a program meeting the second uh wednesday of the month and the fourth wednesday of the month we actually have competition and so we have have judges and and uh submit you know photographs for critique so so thank you for for saying that steve very much yeah. And I've got another guest by the name of Kim, uh, Kim Norris. So Kim, I'll have you unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about you and kind of what you're looking to get from the camera club and any questions that you would have for either myself or any of the other members. Um, well, I'm originally from Texas and I relocated here for a um, career opportunity that's um, in the Denver area. So I've been up here since the end of 2019. Okay. Um, I've been doing photography probably since I was about 12. And so that's a few couple of decades, I guess. <laughs> um, just looking for a good photography club that's busy and has events and um, doesn't just meet, but you know, also goes out and actually does photography out in the field too. I mean, this is an amazing state and to sit at home is, is tragic. <laughs> Is. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people that like to get out and photograph stuff too. So, well, very good. I mean, you know, I think Victoria mentioned that you know this. You know, we're we're moving towards being more active in mentor and, and um, you know group shoots and and bringing along people. And and Kim, now that I listened to your voice, I think you joined us the last meeting. So, so I 
you know, That's I didn't okay. recognize your name, but I certainly recognized your voice. So thank you very much for joining us on that. Oh, thank you, thank you. And I guess other bookkeeping, we've got uh, the next competition we've got in, in two weeks. Uh, that's gonna be, um, the, the topic is black and white photography. And it's actually gonna be a judge by one of our former members. He's a phenomenal uh, uh, fine art, uh, black and white photographer. He moved to Charleston, South Carolina. So he, he's a little even further away than Steve is up in Fort Collins. And so, I mean, but he's, he's phenomenal and he's, he's very, very, um, Oh, I guess what's the right word? I mean, he's he's very very sensitive, but but informative, and so he'll he'll talk about each individual image, and and it's it's not only really to hey here's what I like, but here's what you could have done to do a little better, maybe a little bit more contrast or whatever. So I would really encourage everyone to to listen to Kevin Holiday, and that's going to be in two weeks. The description of that competition is going to be on the website. So I would urge you to um, to explore that. So unless anybody else has anything, I think I'm going to launch in and introduce Nick tonight. So um, I followed Nick for a couple of years, and I think he actually um, kind of introduced himself to us. It's a nice way of saying stock. Yeah, I no, stalked you, you guys. <laughs> well, it is what it is. But I mean, you know, I, I, I admired your hustle. Uh, for you know, approaching to hey, I, I'm a photographer. I give talks, you know, educate people in in photography. I'd love to talk to your camera club. So I'm glad that our schedule finally you know finally meshed, Nick. So so I'm going to introduce Nick, and then I'll keep them keep these uh, comments fairly brief, and then I'll turn it over to Nick. But Nick was raised in Carbondale, Colorado, so very very envious. And as I remember off of his um, website, he, he, they had a single family subscription to National Geographic and, and five TV channels, which doesn't surprise me in, in Carbondale growing up. But, <laughs> but you know, the only family channels that they watched regularly was, was Nature on PBS or the Tour de France. Uh, this is where his love for adventure and outdoors and travel photography and, and travel in general took, took shape. He's now based in San Luis Obispo and focuses on landscape photography classes and workshops as well as selling custom and limited edition prints for businesses and homes. His landscape work is taking him all over the planet from backcountry of Greenland to windswept mountains of Patagonia, frigid extremes of Alaska. His portfolio of work encompasses aerial photography, desert, ocean, night, and mountain photography. So a true landscape photographer in, in true words. In addition to exploring his website online and field workshops, I would encourage you to explore the blog section of his website where he offers 11 free photography how-to articles that are that are a great read. I mean, kind of how to how to how to organize your your equipment, how to how to take pictures of the moon. And I mean it's it's fun. I, I applaud you, Nick, for for giving things away for free and you know and and, and doing that. So uh, he recently announced a speaker series during the next couple of months with some of the best photographers on the planet who rarely speak to audiences or give presentations. And I'll, I'll let you um, introduce or tell you a little bit more or have Nick tell you a little bit more about that. I'm planning on spending at least um, five or six of the seven. Um, if, if these people are, are named people. These, they're great teachers. They're great, uh, they're, they're great um, in, in their field. So. So with that, Nick's presentation tonight is going to be about, about, about evaluating and working with light and landscape photography. So it's all about the light. And Nick, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, a, it's an honor to, to return back to Colorado, even virtually, uh, to, to spend the time there. So, um, so I'm going to start my share. You've already started the recording. So we should be good to go in that regard. Um, and one thing I don't think we did address that just is simple and easy is that uh, questions are usually, uh, I'll spend as much time at the end for questions. Um, you can put them in the chat as we're going, but, um, I take information through pretty quickly and sometimes they build into answering questions as we go through. Um, so I've typically found holding them to the end is the best way to do it, especially on a topic as passionate that I am, as I am about light, uh, as we talk through this. So this should be good. So you should be seeing uh, my image from my most recent backpacking trip in the Sierra um, before I jump in. And this was a truly example of what I would call intimidating light. 
it was so unbelievably uh, different than I've experienced in many, many years in the mountains in terms of the softness and the austere qualities of it. So I'm pretty excited about this and it was just completely blown away. But we're not there to talk just about that. We're here to talk about evaluating and working with light in nature and landscape photography. And I kind of use nature and landscape a little bit interchangeably uh, as we go through this. One part nature, one part landscape, I consider the two of them that kind of blend together as we go through. Uh, but this course in itself kind of builds on a little bit of my mission uh, as a photography educator, as a teacher, uh, and that is helping amateur nature photographers who are interested in deeper connections create more impactful images so they can confidently and consistently express themselves. I came to this in two parts, one through my work through Nick Stover Photography, where I lead workshops, but also through my work uh, through a company or a website I founded or a group called Nature Photography Classes, and teaching and working with camera clubs and individuals uh, and leading online classes and discovering what we are really searching for in our work as photographers and in particular nature, wildlife, uh, landscape or outdoor photographers, however you wanna look at yourself. And that is a deeper level of connection. Uh, so what I hope to be able to bring forth tonight and what I teach and what we're gonna talk about is that level of connection because when I'm talking about connection. I'm talking about your connection to the natural environment. I heard the individual that was uh, a guest tonight of the connection to other photographers, the connection to ourselves oftentimes and how we operate. And in doing so, we're looking to create impactful images. And I say the word impactful because I'm not here to teach you how to create beautiful Instagram, Facebook worthy type things as much as impact of what we're trying to communicate, what we're feeling. But at the same time, what do we struggle with? Well, confidence and consistency within our work. How can we confidently represent ourselves? How can we consistently express what we're feeling or what we're experiencing within the natural environment? So that is my goal as we talk about light and as we work through tonight. But as we talk about light, let's think a little bit about the importance and maybe kind of set the stage of has light always been that important? And we go back all the way to George Eastman, the founder of Eastman Kodak, the man that brought the digital age, or excuse me, brought the film age, not the digital age to us. Light makes photography, embrace light, admire it, love it, but above all, know light. Know it for all you were worth and you will know the key to photography. So what has changed since George Eastman spoke these words oh so long ago? absolutely nothing. I would say light today is as important, if not more important, as we work through the photography and understand how to engage audiences or how to communicate what we're seeing out there within the landscape. But as a modern landscape photographer, modern landscape artist, however we want to think of ourselves, well, we have to also look back at the principles and what goes into this uh, back in the days of even 1872, uh, Thomas Moran putting the light on the landscape into prime perspective. And what he is using here, these principles, what he is working on and the way we see and understand light, well, we're working on contrast, lights to darks within this image, giving us a feeling of depth warms to cool, that we're gonna go towards the brighter parts within images uh, sooner. We're gonna go and find those things we see, the brighter spots all the way in there, bringing about depth and dimensionality, creating that movement and engagement within the landscape. So we as photographers, when we go to these actual locations, when we might actually choose a little bit of what kind of lighting conditions we're looking for in an ideal setting, what kind of environment we're looking to bring forth in our work. So when I'm at the Grand Canyon of the uh, Grand Canyon of Yellowstone last September, I'm looking for certain types of lighting that's going to bring about a different type of composition. I'm looking at the different types of lighting, the muted light coming kind of coming through the storm clouds out there within the distance. It's going to bring about a more impactful image and show more of the depth and dimensionality. So as we look a little bit into the past, well, that can shape a little bit of what we have going forward. We look at someone like Albert Beardstadt. He painted this painting among the Sierra Nevada from his studio in Rome, and he was notorious 
for kind of gathering insights and inspirations out there within the field, and then going back and producing these just magnificently inspiring pieces or places and his use of light and the way he brought it about within the landscape. So for me, when I was in Glacier National Park a couple of years ago, you know, I'm looking to the same types of principles and what I'm capturing and what I'm bringing about in my landscape. I want to show some of that awe, some of that wonder uh, that I'm seeing and experiencing within the natural environment and out there. So we can look to the past to help us push forth and really bring forth a lot in the present, but we can also kind of look within ourselves a little bit and open up a little bit of a dialogue with how we think about light, what we choose to recognize. Hey, here's a Colorado picture. This is Snowmass Lake. This was in 2017. Anti-crepsicular rays, so God rays that are coming up as the sun's kind of setting down over towards marble in that area here and projecting the light up. And thinking about light is about understanding that the light itself doesn't actually change at sunrise or sunset or in the middle of the day. It's all white light coming through. What changes is the atmosphere. And what happens at sunrise or sunset is there's more atmosphere, there's more particulates, there's more moisture within the air as we're getting, the sun is getting closer to the ground, which is softening the light. And that is what brings about the more ideal light we want to see oftentimes, a softer light within the landscape. So if we think about this in the winter months, the sun is going to be lower, we're going to see a little bit more of that softer light. In the summer months, as all of us know, or those of you in Colorado above a mile high, while that bright sun in the summer, well, we're going to see that harsher light. So how are we working with that environment and kind of thinking about the optimal light we need? And as we think about that optimal light, well, also thinking as well about how our eye sees things compared to how our camera actually will capture and what it chooses to view. And we think of the words of Galen Rao. I began to realize that the camera sees the world differently than the human eye. And sometimes those differences can make the difference between, excuse me, make the difference, can make a photograph more powerful than what is actually observed. And I think this is really key to understand as we work with the light and we do night photography or we do other types of things where the sensor is going to bring about a different level of depth a different level of dynamic range than our eyes can see. And not always for the better, because when we look at our cameras compared to our eyes, and we should think or start to think about the ranges or the stops of light that are out there. The range of light that can be measured through specialized equipment on the planet is about 30 stops. The darkest of darks to the brightest of brights. Well, our human eyes, we can see about 24 stops of light. So with us, we can instantly discern between the brightness of the sky, of the looking out of a window from the darkness of the foreground of where we are. But what can our cameras actually capture? Our cameras can capture about 14 to 15 stops of light, some of the better ones today, meaning that we, our cameras, are never going to capture the full amount of light that we see. And this is where people think, oh, I need to bracket so I can get back to that 24 stops. Well, there's one other level down, and this is the key thing in how I choose to engage and think about light. How much light can our printers or our monitors actually display? And this is where we get down to about 10 stops. So rather in our photography to be focused around getting back to that 24 stops of light, we need to be focused in the midtones and the smaller portions of the light that can actually be displayed in our printed work or on the web. And so when we think about this, remember I'm trying to get you to understand or to think or to talk about how our camera sees things differently, how our camera sees things differently related to the eye. Well, let's look at our camera. This image right here is a raw image straight out of camera. F22, I'm getting that Sunstar. This is my raw capture, Nikon D810 at the time when I took this image, completely dull, completely lifeless, most people would say this image is underexposed, but yet when we look at this, yes, I have some clipping. My highlights are always gonna clip if I'm photographing directly into the sun, but I know that the dynamic range, if I'm capturing in raw format, I can pull back so much detail 
as I open up my shadows, as I slightly increase my exposure, as I work a little bit of my whites, as I take down that little teeny bit of the highlights to be able to capture a scene or a situation like this. So understanding how the camera is gonna see something and capture it, well, that shapes a lot of how I'm gonna then post-process the image all the way through. And so there's part of that understanding how your camera operates and how we can bring back that detail within the post-processing. There's also the part of how we see light as we're capturing our images. And the simple truth is our eyes don't have a choice in terms of what we see or how we see things. The longest wavelength light will be seen the soonest within our images. This is gonna be our reds, our oranges, our yellows. We are gonna see that before we see our shadows, that cooler wavelength light, our blues, our teals, our purples. So if we're looking at a scene or a situation, going all the way back to thinking over the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone with the Moran or whatever else we're doing, the eye, the coolness should recede into the image and the brightness should be advancing. And what does that look like in natural environments or our images? Well, let's look at this image, one of the ones that's legally taken from a plane of the Grand Prismatic in Yellowstone. And you'll see that color prism I'm talking about right here playing out in real time right in front of us. So the areas that are closest to us, well, that's the brighter contrast here, the brighter luminosity of those reds and those oranges and those yellows. Well, those are really jumping out. Those are the ones that are exposed to the light the soonest. And as it gets deeper, as we go into the depth of this, this is where we see our blues, our teals, our purples. So as I'm capturing a scene like this, or I'm post-processing a scene like this, I'm wanting to make extra sure not to boost up my saturation and lose that detail that's down below there, or allow one color to completely take over what's going on to keep an accurate representation of what I've witnessed or what I saw out there within the field. So if we can understand a little bit of how our camera sees light, a little bit of how we should be dealing with the light as we're post-processing, that will also help us to understand more of the value of light within our photography. So the value of the light, well, how and where does it create things within our images? What is actually occurring when we talk about the values or what light does? Well, light brings about a depth or progression within our email, or excuse me, within our images. What this does with depths of pro progression is it creates space. And if we can create space within our images, bringing about depth and dimensionality, where we're storing a little bit of that 3D world that we see as humans that get lost in the two dimensions of pictures, the gradients of brightness in a scene or a situation, those layers and levels are bringing about that progression and your brain and your mind is looking at that scene and really interacting with it. And interaction is the number one thing we're looking for, light creating that interaction, that movement between the warms and the cools, the brights and the darks, going back to that shorter wavelength, cooler light, to the longer wavelength, warmer light of the sunset that's down there. This allows us to engage and interact and explore things like textures, maybe a little bit of the texture of the seaweed, a little bit of the texture that's going on out there within the water itself. And we're, as we're exploring in these variations, these subtle variations in light, well, we're seeing that dimensionality really come forth. And when we talk about flat images, what flat images mean to me is lighting that's not dynamic, that doesn't bring about these levels of interaction. And I make the argument time and time again that light creating interaction is exactly what we're looking for within the images. So as we're thinking about interaction and we're thinking about our compelling images that we're looking to do, so whether it's gonna be in our capturing techniques or how things are gonna be showcased or how we post-process, well, this is the five things that I'm constantly looking at as I'm post-processing, as I'm capturing, as I'm evaluating the light out there within the field. Depth, where and how can I focus on transitions within my images? Focus, what is the area or where are people wanting to look within the image? And how am I using the light either to my detriment or to my benefit to make that happen. Sharpness, 
Not everything needs to be completely sharp in grand landscape scenes. Our eyes don't see landscapes sharp from front to back. We see that atmospheric haze out there in the distance. And that gives us these depth cues, these things that are occurring and happening. And I'll give you examples of what these look like. What about textures? What kind of lighting is going to help to bring out textures? People love to be able to engage and interact mentally with textures. What would that feel like? What is causing that? What is occurring within there? But also remembering luminosity. Remember when I said the eye will always go to the brightest spots? This is where we can focus on those contrasts and use this to our advantage. So let's see what this looks like in five images of each one. So textures, where and how are people wanting to feel or touch or what kind of lighting is really gonna help to bring forth a show of texture in a scene or a situation. Sharpness, this is up in the Canadian Rockies in January photographing the ice bubbles, the sharpness. I'm focusing and I'm focus stacking to have the area be the sharpest down in the lower portion of this image. I want this to be sharp. This shouldn't be out of focus, but it isn't the main focus. I want it to be really sharp. And then the same way my eye would see it start to fade a little bit as we go back out there within the scene or the situation. Depth, well, how am I using the lighting this case, I'm using a lot of side lighting, which we'll talk about next, how light shapes our images to bring about a tremendous amount of that depth and that feeling. This is in the Ibex dunes in Death Valley. And I'm using the lines of how they're creating that serpentine flow to kind of lead you back through. And I have the clouds in this particular instance and case helping to build that case. And we have a lot of depth, a lot of focus, a lot of these textures and the lighting is what's bringing this all about. Focus, well, how and where are people going to look uh, in a scene or a situation like this? The dappled lighting, how it's working through there, it's helping to accentuate the focus uh, within this particular scene. And then luminosity, how the eye will always go to the brightest spots. We can find supporting things to really drag us or push us through into these areas. But the eye is going to go over oftentimes as it looks as a scene it's gonna go over those cooler parts and really focus on the warm portions. And then as it's engaged with the warm portions, it's gonna kind of pull back and investigate other parts of this. This is the Perea Canyon uh, in Utah. So understanding these five things that go into it understands or help us to understand, well, how are we gonna look about how light shapes our images? So anywhere you see one of these QR code scanners, there'll be a couple more coming up. You can scan it with a smartphone uh, and you can download the charts. I have different charts and graphs or some stuff on composition that we're not talking about tonight. All free things on my website you can get for free. Also takes you to the speaker series pages or my, uh, my workshop pages as well. Uh, so this is a great way to connect. There'll be other stuff at the end. But we're going to talk about how light shapes our images, the angle, the direction, the color, and the intensity. And understanding what each types of lighting is going to happen in these areas, well, that's going to help you in this dialogue with light as you go forward. And to help you along the way, I'm going to use a little bit of the words from the late, great Galen Rowell and talking a little bit about his views of light and how he brought it forth in the landscape. And I like this one. The landscape is like being there with a powerful personality and I'm searching for just the right angles to make that portrait come across as meaningful as possible. So thinking of our subjects within there like we're shooting portraiture work or understanding what the angle is related to things, well, that's gonna help us. So we basically only have two angles of light if we're gonna be completely honest. Yeah, we could have mid angle, but we have a high angle and we have a low angle light. And so what low angle light in this particular uh, instance here is good for, this is in the Canadian Rockies, is accentuating. So I have a very, very low angle winter light. So going back to the understanding, the light doesn't get as high. And as we get closer to sunset, it's very low angle. And that's really good for creating a lot of shadows and textures and detail within the scene of the situation versus a high angle light, much more white light very little shadow detail. I don't have any shadows within this image. Some people would say it's a harsh light, but if my intention like here at the wave is to show the details within the undulations and the lines within there and have the image feel extremely uniform, well, I want that harsh light. 
I want that midday light. I do not want shadows within this image that you're getting lost in that are making it feel blocky or choppy all the way through. So matching what I'm wanting to bring forth in my intent to the type of light is a big part of that. So angle, think of the two, high and low. And then we have direction, the direction of the light as it's striking our subject or illuminating our subject. And we'll talk about the four right here. And we're gonna talk about Galen. I find some of the hardest photography and the most challenging I've ever done. It's a real challenge to work with natural features in the natural light. And I love this part of photography. I mean, one of the things, the facets I love, I love being in nature, immersed with nature. That's my primary reason to be out there. But I like the challenges of photography and reading the light and understanding it all the way through and understanding what it's going to do. So for me in this scene or situation here, I didn't even break out the real camera on this particular morning because uh, it was a smoky, smoky morning and I was dealing with front light in this particular situation. Front light is my least favorite light. That is where the light is behind you and it's striking your subject. So think of it striking the front of the mountains as the sun comes up or sets all the way down through. And why I don't like flight, ugh, don't like front light is it flattens out my images. I lose a lot of that texture. I lose a lot of that detail within my scenes and situations. I don't have the dimensionality I'm oftentimes going for. It's fascinating when you look at this image here, there's actually a mountain in front of this mountain here, kind of goes up and there's a front mountain and you can't even see that. That front lighting as it's lighting up is completely flattened it out, taking away so much of the texture and the detail we go for. So we can get this from time to time and still make compelling images uh, all the way through, but understanding if we don't have anything that's softening that light ever so slightly. Uh, this area, there was zero clouds uh, and there was smoke in the air, on the, but not enough to soften it to the point where being able to work with the light. So I don't love front light. I do love in certain applications backlight. This is where our subject is in front of our light source, which is the sun for us in landscape photography. It could be something like the moon. And this is really great for details or textures. So whether it's moss hanging down on branches or in this case of this winter oak here on the central coast, I'm wanting to show the arterial branching that's occurring within this oak. So I'm waiting for the point in time when the light has dropped down below and that backlighting is going to come through and really show that branching as it works all the way through. So silhouettes can be really, really helpful to bring out with backlighting. We can also use backlighting to do something like this, uh, get creative with sun stars. Uh, so small aperture, wide angle lens, this is F16, shooting into the general direction of the sun and kind of then using that portion of things uh, by partly blocking it in this case, this is the racetrack in Death Valley to create that sun star. So it's that low angle light, it's accentuating those textures. I have some lack of uniformity on my shadows, which is fine in this scene and situation, but we can use the backlighting. So if we have that backlighting, we have the sun that's there, this is where I'll oftentimes play around with sun stars and they need a partial block of the object. So something that's gonna partially block the sun ever so slightly, a small aperture F16 to F22 and a wide angle lens and you're going to be able to get this effect and it isn't something I generate in Photoshop or whatever else to be able to get that. So backlight can be fun to work with. My favorite kind of light, oh, side light. And the reason I love side light, well, it's falling at about a 90 degree angle from my subject I'm photographing and me. So it's falling in between us. It's dimension. And dimensionality with light and how we work with light is an absolute thing we want to get. Look at the details, look at the textures, look at the variations, look at the separation that is occurring in an, itch, an image like this. That side light ever so slightly kind of filtered through the clouds as well. We can see very distinct detail, very, very strong transitions within a scene or a situation all the way through. So anytime I can be working a scene or a situation with side light, that's always going to be my top choice. Uh, I'll work things through. Another type of light, well, is top light. And I would say it's very hard to come by and hard to photograph. But when you're working with crepsicular rays, the God rays that come down out of the sky, you're working with top light. If you're in a slot canyon like this one here in Arizona, I'm working with top light. It's harsh. It's very rare. We don't see it. We need to have something 
going up into the air, dust, particulates, moisture, something else to be able to really help to accentuate top light. And oftentimes when we're photographing top light, the light itself is the focus. This particular scene, the way the light radiates out and reflects, well, I get the canyon as well as part of that. So top light's pretty rare. Uh, the most frequently ones you would see are all three of the other side, front end, and backlight, and just knowing how to work with those and what you're intending to bring. Uh, characteristics of light, well, the color of light. Uh, most people would say it's just a yellow or a white light. Um, light doesn't have most color all the time. And I would say, well, we almost never set out to photograph a landscape, nor do I think of a camera as a means of recording a mountain. My first thought is always of light. This is Galen once again. And we're thinking about the colors of light and how we see things differently. So the color of light is gonna bring about something like this. And we're pretty much only have two colors, the cools and the warms in terms of the color of light. We're gonna have different light reflected back within the landscape. That's totally different. But the lighting itself, we have cool light and warm light for the most part of what we work with. The color of the light here, this is the variations which is interesting. So this is a intentional camera movement of a sunset on the beach here on the central coast. And what I have here is the sand. And I have where the waves are actually crashing down here on the sand and the ocean, then the horizon, then the sunset, then the area that's above the horizon. So we think of a scene or a situation in a non-intentional camera movement, and we're gonna be focused and transfixed almost completely on that sunset because of the brightness to the point of understanding or forgetting, I should say, oftentimes a lot of that variation in the lighting that's leading us back to that point in time. And understanding a little bit of this color of light and how it interacts helps us set some of the tone or the mood that we're going for. So we have blue light or cool light. Uh, oftentimes, Cobb, we talk about the blue hour. Um, and when we get into the blue hour, well, we got some green light. We have blue light. In this case, it's very purple light. Alaska, early March, negative 20 degrees when I was out photographing uh, Denali up here. And I'm just completely bathed in a cool light. Um, so we're going to have a much different feeling, a lot more coolness in terms of how the image feels to us emotionally. The coldness we might feel or experience. Uh, sometimes people will still buy this print specifically to match a color palette uh, within a home. But a lot of people, when they look at this, they have a feeling of coldness. Uh, a blue light, for example, though, can convey maybe a little bit more of mystery of that awe and wonder. So this one's here on the Central Coast, photographing a stack of sea, uh, sea stacks out there, long exposure. This is actually the ocean itself creating that wispy feeling. It almost feels like mountaintop speaking out within there. And that lower contrast, long exposure, post blue hour scene, well, everything feels awash. So for me, in this particular situation, I don't want you as the viewer to be able to tell where the ocean ends and the sky begins. I want to just feel all one color. So the rocks themselves will kind of go back through there. So understanding what kind of light, what kind of technique that drives things versus something like golden light. Well, the sun nearing the horizon, this is a backlighting situation. So not a front light, the backlight, the light I'm photographing into. So I'm gonna get some of those silhouettes. And in this particular case, I'm also gonna get a huge variation of the lighting that's going on between the warms and the cools. Remember I talked earlier about how we can get those alterations between warms and cools, the complementary colors that are opposite each other. That's gonna create a lot of movement and dynamic kind of interaction with our images. So anytime we can get that, we're gonna have an image that's gonna have a light, lot of a different feel, a lot more warmth, a lot more cheeriness, a lot more calmness is gonna come out of a golden light situation all the way through. So those are our three, angle, direction, and color. And the next one we're gonna talk about, well, is intensity. And there's a lot that goes into intensity of light uh, that we can really understand a lot of the nuances. And I think this is the last time I referenced Galen. I take a drink. When the light is right and everything is working for me, sometimes mere seconds, excuse me, I don't need to chew on that ice cube, can make the difference between a superb image and a mundane one. And I love this concept, but I don't completely buy the philosophy because I definitely have examples, and I'll show you a couple in here, where that mere second makes the difference. 
But other times, a superb image and a mundane one is understanding what the characteristics of the light are and what my intent are is what makes it separates that superb from the mundane. So when we talk about the characteristics of light, how do we describe light? Well, we have something here like refracted light. And refracted light literally is one of those periods or those places or that point in time when we need to be pre prepared to react very quickly. This is a high Sierra lake um, on the eastern part of the Sierras, so right where the sun kind of rises up over Death Valley. This was 4th of July a few years ago. Very harsh light rising. No dust. I mean, there's no clouds out there to soften the sunrise light. Very, very dry up here and very, very hot over there. And so the light is coming up and it's striking the Sierras, uh, the Sierra granite and reflecting off the granite and going down into the water. As it goes down into the water, I need a very low angle light from the sun striking and reflecting at a low angle down into the water. And as it does, it takes on a different form. And it takes on this different form when we get these whirlpools that are occurring. You can see these like whirlpool effects that are occurring just in the ripples of the water. And these slight variations in the cooler light that's down below the ripples and then the top parts that are getting that warmer light within there, we're creating that complementary color feel within the image very, very easily. Um, not very, very easily, but very, very dynamic in terms of how we're going to engage and what we're going to feel or see curves and lines and shapes within that. Refracted light, though, is that low angle, kind of those perfect circumstances, and it doesn't last very long. You're not going to get refracted light all that often beyond very, very early periods of time because it takes so many variables, the light hitting just right, bouncing off just right, and working all the way through. So refracted is different than reflected. So this is actually just outside of Telluride a couple of years ago when I was through for fall colors and I'm getting reflected light in the middle of the day. So the blue sky that's up there and the light is reflecting off of the trees, the aspen trees themselves and taking on a slightly different reflected form. It's softening the scene uh, to kind of make it feel a little bit more painterly all the way through. I don't need early morning light to bring about reflected light. I can get this almost any time of day. And you can also see reflected light in canyons. You can see reflected light uh, in other places where the light is hitting one area strongly and bouncing off. So you need to have some type of a reflective surface to create reflected light uh, all the way through. Ambient light, well, it kind of goes to the complete opposite. So subtle and warm, we're going to produce a lot of kind of feathered, pleasing shadows, uh, low contrast, low tones. Uh, this scene in direct light is extremely off-putting with the angular lines and kind of the jagged feel that's there. But this is a low growth area in Yosemite and this really soft light that's trickling all the way down through there with that ambient portion, well, it's creating a really like nature type feel a lot of really pleasurable things. You can see a lot of the depth of the different elements and levels of the shrubs that are down there. Um, the other thing about ambient light, which is great for small scenes, is you can create it yourself. Um, so if you have an area that you like the scene, but there's too much bright light, well, maybe you can bribe somebody to stand there with their coat and block the light for a little bit for you. Or in this case, I loved the scene, but I had little shafts of light coming through that was making it really off-putting. And I asked my backpacking partner, hey, Tom, will you stand there for a minute and block the light for me? Uh, he's not a photographer, but he goes along with what I do. And that created the scene of what I wanted to deal with. So ambient light, that subtle and warm light is different though than diffused light. So diffused light is really, really helpful. And we get this in overcast conditions on a regular basis to photograph more difficult things. And when we're talking about more difficult things, the ones that come to mind here, which probably isn't too different than maybe trying to photograph the butt of a deer or something else like that, a bighorn sheep face, the two ones here on the coast that are really hard to photograph, sea otters and monarch butterflies. And the reason they're so hard, a sea otter is so hard to photograph because it's a dark bodied animal laying in a dark water environment with a white face. So you're going to be clipping that face and not pulling enough detail out necessarily um, within the body itself because of the dark on dark. And you're not going to get the relief you're necessarily seeking. 
monarch butterflies. They're up in the tree canopies, up in the eucalyptus, really, really dark within there. And they have really, really bright wings that's there. So people that are bird photographers see this on a time and time again basis oftentimes too with the contrast between the scenes and situation. Diffuse light in those situations is great. You have the cloud, you have this giant soft box that's kind of reflecting light up into these areas and you can now get some added light that's going up in there and that really helps. And so the highlights would blow out really quickly, but in this scene, I'm getting diffuse light. I'm getting some uh, low marine layer here that's just kind of diffusing the light and reflecting it up there. Um, so that's a really, really helpful thing. Not too different, but a little bit different than flat or even light. And flat or even light, well, this is a scene or a situation where it's gonna be an overcast day or as storms kind of break up. And if you have too much cloud cover, well, you don't get the delineation you're necessarily looking for to show the detail. So I've been photographing here in the whole rainforest for quite some time uh, on that particular day. And it had been really cloudy and really rainy. And I was not getting anything I was remotely happy with. And as we started walking back to the car, well, the light started to break up just ever so slightly. And I got just enough lighting variation still very flat and even to show the details that I want and what I was looking for. And now you can see the maples. Now you can see the ferns. Now you can see the mosses. You can see the structures. You can see all the different variations of things within here that you couldn't in a flat light. And you absolutely can't in a bright, harsh light. So knowing what lighting conditions I was looking for, well, that all of a sudden put me in a scene or a situation to be able to react. Uh, and in flat or even light, well, you have a lot of time. You can work scenes. You can see what works or don't work. I never had photographed in a rainforest before. I'm trying my wide angle lens. It was horrible, distorted, didn't look right. Couldn't get things to line up. It was like just way off versus the compression of a longer lens. And so I had a lot of time on this day to try different things and kind of get to where I liked all the way through. So I really started to like uh, that flat or even light as I work scenes and situation. The opposite of the flat or even in terms of how we work, well, spotlight. And that's that rare light, that fast moving light. When you see it occurring, you need to be putting yourself in a position to be able to capture that kind of pretty quickly without it necessarily being around for too long. And I'll show you what that looked like on this particular day. And then we'll go back to the image. So I got down uh, to this area. This is a coastal area just north of here. Um, kind of what I call my private beach because everybody thinks it's closed to the public, but it's actually not. So if you come on one of my coastal workshops, we'll get to go here. Um, and we won't be breaking any laws, I swear. And so what I have going on here is I have the marine layer out here in the distance and I have a cloud layer. And when the marine and the cloud layer here on the coast, which isn't too different, the different types of clouds up there within the mountains and the high Rockies start to intersect, the clouds don't come into the area, create a little bit of that side lighting opportunity that's there and then took a whole bunch of pictures. That's part of the joy of being a photographer sometimes. Sometimes the wave would crash and I wouldn't have any light. Next time the wave would crash and it would be huge out of the frame. I wouldn't have the movement I want. I wouldn't have the activity or the engagement. Next time the wave would crash and it was like all the way through until I finally got the right one. I had the right wave crash, the right kind of lighting on that situation to create those transitions and a lot of that depth and dimensionality. So understanding what I'm looking to convey or understanding what kind of light really helps all the way through. And then my last one on the intensities of light, and then we'll talk about some tips and tricks and take some questions as well, is dappled light. And this is where we have a little bit of that even mix between spotlighting uh, and kind of an even light kind of situation. This is in Glacier National Park. And I love this dappled lighting. So the clouds, the sun in this case is relatively high, usually for dappled light, and you're going to be uh, relatively high in the sky, and you're going to have maybe 50% or more cloud cover. So these are the kind of things to be looking at. And the reason I love dappled light is a couple of reasons. One is it creates those transitions for me automatically. So now I have the light to dark transitions. I'm automatically creating depth and dimensionality. The other reason is usually when I get dappled light, I just sit down. And I relax and I enjoy the environment for a longer period of time and wait for the lighting to come to me. Uh, because oftentimes we're trying to force light, we're trying to push things. And dappled light for me, I'm waiting, taking pictures, just absorbing the environment. This is Dawson, Pitamakan, and Glacier. So I had the right mix of lighting. I had light up here and light on this mountain, light on this far mountain, and I have darkness kind of down through here. 
And that is where I'm going for. I got lighting in my two main focal point areas within the image. Uh, and I have some of the variations all the way down through. So that's a big part of it is where do you want the focus to be going back to what I talked about? And I wanted the focus to be on these pointy peaks. So I waited for the right lighting conditions to get there all the way through. So that's the last bit of intensity. And we're gonna talk about uh, how we can most effectively use light within our images. Uh, and then we're gonna talk, I think about, what was the last one I wanna talk? Well, we'll get to the last, there's about 10 slides left. So bear with me, we're, we're on track. So I'm all the way good. All right, so the last is how, or second to last, how can we most effectively use light within our images? And one of the ways we can really use it, well, there's a storytelling component. And I think by this point in time, you guys really clearly understand that the eye is gonna to go towards the warmest and the brightest part of an image without fail. And our proper use of light, so in this case or instance, I'm using the moon, not the sun, the moon coming up to accentuate this oak tree in this scene or situation. And I'm using the light to direct you exactly where I want you to go. I wanna focus the attention just on the oak, just on the, on the mountain or the moon behind it all the way through there. So we can use the light to really amplify or focus attentions, but we can really also use it to amplify transitions. So the way it's striking the landscape, thinking about this, I have a sand dune, this is down here on the coast, the light is striking this one dude that's in the sun, reflecting off of that and creating a different color, a different feel on this other area within there. So this is also amplifying our transitions. We now have really, really strong texture lines. We have really, really strong angular lines that are bringing a lot of structure and a lot of movement to the image. The right kind of lighting makes this possible. The other way we can use light, well, is to tell a story. The Italians actually have a word for it, chia roscuro, and that is the balance of light and shadows or the dramatic effect uh, of the contrast between those two. So if we take this image and I call it my heart of stone, and I captured this one up in the Sierra a few years ago where the light was almost perfectly splitting down the center portion, kind of coming down that line and the flower itself was in a heart shape all the way through. And then the first time I processed this image, on the left, it just looked like garbage, absolute crap. And what I lost as I'm processing this image was that storytelling capability of showing the full form of what's there. So I'm using the light to tell the story of the light and the darkness we have within us, uh, an element of composure. And as I'm post-processing this, well, I'm not gonna take my highlights down too much or open my shadows all the way. I'm gonna do selective adjustments to allow you to see that full form and some of that darkness while not having the bright side be all the way out there. So if I didn't have a clear vision of how I wanted to tell the story, well, my post-processing would have kind of turned out like it did the first time, uh, and that was pretty bad. We can also use it to produce different effects. Uh, so here's one here on the Central Coast, sand dune uh, going out, Milky Way setting out there in the distance, really beautiful area all the way through, kind of wanted to have these lines and these textures used photo pills to figure out when it was gonna be there, photographed when it was gonna be there, and wow, that looks horrible because there's no ambient light that's out there within the environment. And I knew this ahead of time. I knew as we got into this area, and I can't, sand, I can't light paint a 40 foot dune that's out there. I knew this is what I was gonna be dealing with. So now I kind of turn to, well, the areas to work a scene. I know that if I wait to the blue hour to the stars are out, well, I'm gonna have the sand dune colors. I'm gonna have those textures that are there within the image that I can then go through at a later point in time and combine the two images together. So I'm using the effects of the light, that low, low angle post blue hour light to bring out the textures and then waiting for, this, for the Milky Way to come out a little while later. Don't move the camera, just stay there for a little while and then snap the picture later. And then the other one we can do, or the fourth one is to see a scene differently and break out of our normal mode of light. So here's the Canadian Rockies. This was in 2018 to Jack Lake. I get up there kind of liking a little bit of the composition, looking out over uh, Rundle, back just outside of Banff, the lighting starting to come up, uh, loving the clouds all the way through, but the wind kicks up. And now we have horizontal lines that are within there that's not provoking that calm, not bringing out the reflection I really want. So it's made a matter at that point in time, neutral density filter goes on, 
we bring out different hues within the clouds, we flatten out the water, but knowing that the light was going to be working for me within this situation really helped to bring out that. And then the final bit, well, three ways we can deepen our understanding of the ways to work with light. Well, this one, sorry, this one here is in Atacama Desert in Northern Chile. I went there uh, for a couple of weeks this last uh, March, excuse me, April, May, I went there and then up into the Bolivian Altiplano, which was oh, so unbelievably incredible. Uh, thank God I'm good at altitude. Uh, the, the first one is to revisit locations in different types of light. Uh, so one of my favorite photography locations here on the coast is the Oceano Dunes. It's a bunch of sand dunes uh, that are right there on the ocean. Um, pretty short walk to get in there, go after a windstorm or go during the week. You're not going to see anybody else. You're not going to see footprints or anything else. But what I found is as I've worked these dunes in different lighting types, side lighting, back lighting, front lighting, night lighting, um, any type of situations, blue hour, golden hour, I see the scenes way differently. And as I see these scenes differently, well, that helps me to see the light differently and understand and bring forth a lot more of my light, just like photographing in black and white. So all of our digital cameras, you can put your camera into monochrome mode. And when you're photographing in monochrome, it's still capturing a full color raw image, but you're going to see your previews in monochrome and you're going to see the lighting variations much, much differently if you're photographing in black and white. So this is really helpful. If you don't want to do that, I do recommend post-processing your images in black and white. Do a bunch of conversions. Understand how to process some images in black and white. You're going to start to see the tones and the light a lot differently. Or use luminosity masks. Those are also exceptionally helpful. And then the third way to, th to deepen your understanding, well, come learn from the pros. So these people here, Mark, Adamus, Eric Bennett, Alistair Ben, Sarah Marino, Guy Tall, Josh Cripps, Aaron Bobnick. These are friends of mine that I've learned from over the years or we've spent time together in the natural environment. And these people are exceptional educators and people in often cases like Mark Adamus who never speak publicly or rarely speak publicly, either based on their travel schedules or getting things to align. So bringing these seven people together, I'm so excited uh, because of their transformative work and what they bring forth and what they represent uh, within what they do. So this speaker series that starts in two weeks, actually, Mark's going to kick us off by talking about looking within. And then Eric, who was the uh, nature landscape photographer of the year last year, adding by subtracting, he's really good on excluding and bringing things out. Alistair, the emotional language of vision. Aaron's going to talk about beyond perfection, balancing artistry and technique within your photography. Josh, stop being a one-dimensional photographer. Guy, who many of you know through his writing, creativity and expression in photography. He's only given this presentation one other time. Um, only the second, this is only gonna be the second group that's ever heard it. Sarah, the expansive mindset, photography experience, et cetera. So they're only 10 bucks per speaker and you no need to be there to see them. Uh, you can actually get the recordings. If you wanna ask questions and see them live, you can, that's highly encouraged. Uh, and that's on the website, naturephotographyclasses.com slash speaker series. You'll see it right there on the main page, or you can scan the QR and I'll put the link in the chat in a little bit. Uh, the final two things I'll mention and then we'll take questions. One is uh, I'm teaching a couple workshops on the coast that are full. I am teaching one in Death Valley, February 16th to the 20th. Uh, I just recently announced that I have three spots left. Um, so if you're interested in that, that's on my photography website. You'll see the QR thing as well. Uh, to scan that all the way through. Uh, love to see you there. Any questions, feel free to email me on this one. Happy to answer questions uh, and work through. But De Death Valley is definitely one of my favorite places to photograph. Uh, I'm looking forward to taking a workshop group out there in February. And then the final thing I'll mention is I run nature photography classes. I have about 16 different courses on here. Uh, I teach one of the ones on light, which you just heard. Also, I have one on image design, color, post-processing. I do ones on photo pills, focusing, uh, post-processing. Anything you can think of is on there. Uh, and if you use the code TRY10, you can save $10 off any course. Um, so definitely check this out as well and let me know if there's any questions. And with that, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to talk with you about light all the way through on this particular evening uh, to spend some time with some Colorado people. And with that, I'm going to stop my share and we'll take questions.
Well, Nick, I'll yeah. kick off. I'm I'm blown away by you know how much information you shared on light. I you know I I don't think that I really you know kind of got the depth of what you talked about with light. I mean you know kind of it, it's always there, but you know it it certainly helps as you've broken this down. I, I see a couple of interesting things. It's it's patience. You seem to have a lot of patience of waiting for the light to change to. To, you know, get the effect that you're looking for, and also your planning. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was awestruck by the, the one of the side lighting that you took in the Sierras, and so I mean, part of that you, you talked a little bit about planning, but I think that's the key is to understand, you know, kind of where you are, you know, the quality of the light, but then also the angle of the light to produce things like the side lighting. So, yeah. And, and a quick question, then I'll open it up to the other people not to monopolize this. But I mean, you know, the it's the speaker series. This is is not just everybody speaking kind of back to back to back. This, this you know, could you talk a little bit more about the schedule? of? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't have the dates on there. It's uh, uh, So, yeah, Mark's it's about a two week break. Um, so Mark starts on the 25th, then Eric. And then there's a, I don't know, two week break, Alistair, three week break, Aaron. And then Josh is actually pretty close. So it's spread out over the next three months. Yep. And um, and then, yeah, so th this is the intention is for this initial one. And then I already have like the spring speaker series ready to go, which is going to be a little more technical as well. Um, oh. So, yeah, then that's going to be people like Nick Page and uh, so on and so forth. So, okay. Yeah. So, so part two. Part two. But yeah, this first one's I'm, I'm really excited. I mean, Mark uh, has <laughs> he just doesn't give presentations. And I had to bend his arm a little, but hey, he's coming out. Well, and Guy Tall is pretty shy as well, but he yeah, um, Guy doesn't like to promote himself, so I no. told him I'd take care of that. <laughs> All right, so I see a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, editing techniques of warming the highlights—that's a great question, Steve. Um, I spend a lot of time on my editing techniques and getting the white balance right. Um, and making sure that the areas that are getting light have the warmth in them. Uh, and that warmth isn't bleeding into the shadows. And so that's a key thing when I start the image to kind of get that going. The second is I never uh, add global saturation uh, to my images. I always go in and do targeted saturation adjustments if I'm going to do those uh, at a later point in time. And then the other portion on the light uh, is dodging and burning. And I use luminosity masks to dodge and burn. So by dodging and burning, for those of you that don't know, I'm using a mask, which is basically making it idiot proof for me. That's targeting just the light portions of my, email, my, my image or the dark portions. And by burning, I'm going to brighten those up. And by, excuse me, by burning, I'm going to darken them. And by dodging, I'm going to lighten them. Uh, and then there's the big burn, dark, and dodge light. And so I can build masks with one click of a button that'll do just those exact things. And so that's definitely the technique. Uh, and then the local adjustments as well uh, is a big part. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Todd Weidel, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be down on a little adventure right now, down 11 mile uh, state park reservoir. Just finished five days in the sand dunes. Oh, nice. Huge, huge uh, Galen Rowell fan and just haven't uh, kind of fell out of my perspective, but I followed him a lot. I was a climber in the seventies and eighties and um, he, he's kind of uh you know, it's one room of the mountain gods kind of guy. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and the, um, so I loved all his references, and uh, that was a pretty tragic loss when we uh, when we lost him. Yeah. But th thank you for all your information. I have already signed up. Oh, good. Well, I look forward to having attend, you. But uh, for seventy dollars, I figure if I make half of them, it's a bargain. Yeah, so, well, you'll still get the other half of the recordings, too. So if you don't make them live, you'll still get them later. Well, um, I, I, I hope that people, I'll encourage the rest of my fellow Focus members here to uh, use that QR code. Maybe put that up one last time before you leave. Get your phone out, get the camera, at least register for the newsletter. And then it'll be a reminder to, um, you know, maybe sign up for some of these classes. Uh, that. That's exactly what I did. The QR code was very helpful, and we're all using them these days at restaurants. Yeah, let's uh, let's spend seventy bucks for 
something that that we're passionate about. Yeah, I just put the link in the chat for those on there that takes you to that QR reader there where you can get the free eBooks, et cetera, so. And my daughter's a CSU grad, so I have to give you a little little grace. Oh, good, yeah. Well, it's, you know, we'll take it as a Rammy, so. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Absolutely. All right, other questions or comments or? Well, it doesn't look like anybody's gonna give you another question. So I, I appreciate you joining us tonight and sharing all this information with us. So. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, encourage you, you know, to keep in touch, get in touch. And then I'll put my email in there as well. And I think you'll probably send out some follow-up. But people have questions that come up afterwards. I always get a couple that come in afterwards. If somebody that thought of something later or, you know, wanted to ask something but thought it was a stupid question, which it almost never is. So feel free to email me later as well. And then otherwise, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, hope to see some of you for future classes or workshop or come back another day. We'll see what happens. And Steve or Nick, I, I had a really quick question on your on your on your workshop or, you know, on your classes. Those are recorded, correct? Yes. OK, so I just wanted to have clarification, but I think that's great. So but you know, I'm glad you're busy with workshops. I'm glad that people are returning to workshops and wish you the best there. Yeah, no, the workshops have been great. And it sounds like uh, Gwen needs to come come to a Central Coast one, shoot some ocean images. So. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank you, Nick. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. All right. Thank you so much, Bye, Nick. All. This was awesome. Absolutely awesome. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Bye, boss. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Nice job.